Listen, if you're uh, still a little sleepy from last night, uh, I'm going to give you the sermon right up front, two or three sentences, and then you can go back to sleep if you'd like. Uh, but here it is, just in a, in a nutshell. Don't, don't compare yourself to other people. Don't, don't compare. Okay? And uh, the rest of it is just detail. Okay, you can go to sleep now, and I'll talk to everybody else. So we're continuing in a sermon series that runs the 40 days of Lent. And our hope is that we would find the things we might give up, a habit or an item that would give us more direction or time to focus on God, or we take up new habits such as a daily devotional or a Bible reading. And as a church family, we've been looking each weekend at some things that we should consider giving up that will help change our lives forever. Things like shallowness or feeling like you have it all together. Now today I want to address an area of life that I know catches most of us because I've wrestled with it in, in, in myself many times. Um, and that's giving up comparisons. So much of the hate and negativity I see around has at its root people with an unhealthy view of who they are and how God views them. And when you get this wrong, you try to build your worth by tearing other people down so you look better. Or by believing the lie that you don't really matter. Now I want to talk this morning about Zacchaeus from Luke chapter 19, which many of you read this past uh, Wednesday. Uh, I got assigned this text, I'm guessing, because I'm the shortest guy on staff. And Zacchaeus is a short guy, too, and there is a little bit of the short man syndrome that uh, I live with, Johnny. I don't know what to say, but I've always been that way. And uh, so I want to talk about Zacchaeus from chapter 19 of Luke's gospel. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. And when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. That's you and me. You ever wonder what got Zacchaeus into that tree in the first place? I mean, I find it interesting that the passage tells us these things. He was a tax collector. He was short. My personal translation for that is he was the political figure everyone loved to hate. And people made fun of him for his physical limitations. Now, you and I may not be Zacchaeus, but I suspect we have all felt like we weren't quite good enough. We may not be known publicly for our faults, but privately we wonder, am I good, am I good enough? How do I compare with others? Now, let me tell you this. A lie that you believe is true will affect you as if it were true let me say that again a lie that you believe is true will affect you just as if it were true and it's one of satan's greatest uh, weapons to lie to us and he loves that even though something is not true if we believe it we'll live and act as if it were true and people have done this throughout the ages you remember moses 
God himself called Moses to deliver his people from bondage. And Moses felt like many of us. Moses said to the Lord, Oh Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither in the past nor since you've spoken to your servant. He said, I'm slow of speech and tongue. In other words, don't put me in front of people. I freeze. I get nervous. I'm not a good public speaker. Okay, of all the other people out there, God, surely there are dozens who are more qualified than I am. In other words, God, I'm not good enough. Let me let you in on a, a little secret. I may look pretty confident and at and relaxed and at peace up here, but preaching freaks me out. Behind this facade, I am a nervous wreck. I'm shaking. A few years ago, uh, right during this service, when the, we were singing, I was sitting right over there, and I leaned over to Kathy Flake and said, Kathy, I don't uh, feel so great. And she's so sharp, she looked around and she said, well, there's a doctor about five rows back. Do you want me to get her? I said, yeah. And uh, so uh, sweet Michelle Colbreth came up. She was an OBGYN. <laughs> Wasn't exactly what I needed. But she checked my pulse and, uh, and my heart rate and looked at me and said, take two aspirin and go to the hospital right now. I said, oh, come on now. Michelle, I can't do that. Ten minutes, I, I got to do this. And she says, two aspirin, hospital. I said, why don't we go upstairs and call my doctor, who's also a member of Hope, great guy. He's been such a faithful friend for 25 years. And she gets him on the phone, explains what she's explained to me, and he says, uh, put Craig on the phone. And I got on the phone, and he says, take two aspirin, go to the hospital. <laughs> and I did, and uh, after they ran all these tests, they came back and said, you haven't had a heart attack, you had a panic attack. And I realized then, that's what I feel every time I stand up here, because it freaks me out. I mean, you are all very kind to me, but I've got your attention for 30 minutes. What if what I say doesn't seem important? What if I make a mistake? What if you fall asleep during my comments? It's happened. I mean, there used to be a guy that sat right down here on the front row, and he'd fall asleep every service. Back in the South Hall, there were a couple of guys always sat on the front two rows, and they would fall asleep. Not every week, but, you know, with regularity. And every time they fell asleep, I thought, what's wrong with this sermon? I mean, what, what's wrong here? I mean, I'm, I know I'm no Rick Warren or Craig Groeschel or Joel Olstein, but, I mean, really? Is this sermon so bad they got to sleep through it? And I blamed myself. I wasn't good enough. I'm just not good enough. And I found out that the, the guy that slept right here on the front row was an emergency room doctor at the Med, and he worked every Saturday night's midnight shift. He dragged himself in here to go to church right after he got off work. Had nothing to do with me. That's what happens. But I live with those questions. What if you criticize me or disagree with me? All that runs through my head. And if the guy on the front row is sleeping, uh, I think it's a horrible, boring sermon. Now, not that maybe he had a harder, sleepless night, or that maybe he has narcolepsy. I, I mean, I own it. I own it. And I say, well, I must not be good enough. Now, many of us believe the lie. And it affects us as if we were true, as if it were true, because we base our worth on wrong assumptions. Here's a couple of wrong assumptions. To give up a life based on comparison, you have to remember our value is not determined by our past mistakes. Our value is not determined by our past mistakes. Old Zacchaeus 
sure understood about past mistakes. See, in his day, a tax collector had a lot of power. The tax rate was set, and uh, he collected the tax rate, but anything he could collect over and beyond that, he got to keep. That's why he was a wealthy man. Now, we all have made past mistakes, haven't we? I certainly have. Things we wish we hadn't have done. But we don't have to let those things define us. We often wrongly base our worth on our past. I did something stupid, and I just can't forgive myself for what I did. And that's why we talk here about worshiping a God of second chances, and third chances, and fourth chances. Because you're not perfect. And that's why when you come through the door and sit down, that's how come I don't yell and scream at you about the sin in your life. Number one, I don't know the sin in your life. But number two, you're already beat up and feeling so guilty when you walk in here. The last thing I need to do is hammer you some more. We worship a God of second chances. I want you to know that. I want you to catch a glimpse of the hope that you have for your life when you take on this God of second, third, and fourth chances. And then our value isn't determined by what we think about ourselves. See, we, become, we, we, we come to believe the lie that our worth is based on our past experiences. For instance, maybe you grew up in a challenging family and you think, well, I'll never amount to anything. Um, we didn't have a lot. Or maybe you weren't great in school, and so you just believe, I'm just average. I was a, you know, uh, I, I, I'm never going to amount to anything. I mean, I got to tell you, I, I was, and I have friends from Essex High School that are here this morning that will confirm this. I was undoubtedly the worst student at Essex High School, behaviorally. For three years, the three years I was there. Every teacher hated me as far as I knew. And, uh, I, and so I, I have no recollection of any teacher at any level ever believing in me until I was a junior in college. And a professor took an interest in me and a paper I wrote and began looking more closely, and he came to me and he said, I'd like for you to go to Indiana University and work on your PhD. I'd made straight C's all the way through high school. The last two years of college, I made the dean's list. Now, that's mostly because I was engaged and Lee was smarter than I was, and <laughs> I was too proud to, to come in with C's and D's anymore. But you see how your past can influence your future? I was just an average guy. And I believed that. So I lived an average life. Then our value is not determined why, uh, by what people say about us. You know the story. Some of you grew up in a home where you got a lot of encouragement. You felt good about yourself. Others didn't. Others of you grew up hearing you're stupid. And you believed it, or you're no good. And you believed it, or you're pathetic. I wish you were more like your brother, or you're nothing like your sister. I wish I'd never had you. On and on it goes like that. People right here in this room experienced every single one of the things I just mentioned. And you heard it so often that you started thinking, you know what, maybe I'm not good enough. Maybe I'm not good enough. The most important people in my life say I'm not. And it's one of the tragedies of bullying today, especially cyberbullying, which is getting a lot of media attention these days. You have people whose lives are forever impacted, sometimes destroyed by what others say about them. And the truth often is you have someone who believes lies about themselves who only know how to feel better by bullying somebody else. And then also, to give up a life based on comparison, we have to remember our, our value is not determined by what we think others say about us. Regularly, I've got a standard line. I'll see people outside of hope, and they'll say, 
you're great, we miss you so much, and I say the same thing every time. Opinions vary. <laughs> it's true, opinions vary. And you know, Facebook hadn't helped us at all. It's made us believe that everybody has life together. Nobody lays their personal, intimate problems out there for the world to see. You don't ever see a post in the morning from someone that says, I almost killed myself last night, or I had to bail my son out of jail last night. It's the worst day of my life. Or my husband and I are having problems. I don't know what in the world to do about it. I think we're going to end up in a divorce. Or my wife cheated on me, or my husband cheated. We don't put that stuff on Facebook, do we? And, and, and it's, a, it's a thing where we put the things we're proud of out there for people to see. You know, things we like, people, things we're proud of. But it sends this false message to society that, hey, am I the only one that doesn't have it all together? And I can't tell you how many conversations over the years I've had in my own family and with other people who said, you know what? I, I, I mean, with, I, I can't believe that our kids don't measure up to those kids over there. I mean, why do our kids have to be the, the wild kids? Well, because they're preacher's kids. Everybody knows that. <laughs> There's a good reason for it, right, Few. And so, you, but, but Lee and I had that discussion many times, and I, said, I would say, Lee, you don't know what happens behind closed doors. What it looks like on the outside is not what it is on the inside. I don't care what it is on the inside. They're different. Now, 20, 30, 40 years later, you see an awful whole lot of what was going on in those days. Don't compare yourself to other people. So easy to fire off a text of something you would never say to a person, but you just get stuck in your craw that you're going to get it off your chest, and so you fire off that text. Before there were texts, you'd have never done that. You'd never gone over, marched up to their house, and knocked on the door and said to them what you said in that text. You wouldn't even write a letter. Too much trouble. But it's so easy to pull your phone out of your pocket, do this for a minute, and then shoot it onto somebody else and ruin their day or week or month or year or whatever. If I am short and a tax collector, then I must be the worst possible person and God could never want or use me. That's what Zacchaeus is thinking. You see how this lie limits the impact we can make for Christ here at Hope in our community and world? I can think of no greater thing to give up for Lent than our comparing ourselves to others or comparing ourselves to an imaginary standard set for us by Facebook or Instagram or television. Remember, you are not who others say you are, and you are not the sum total of your past experiences. You are who God says you are. You are not the opinions of other people. You are not what happened in your past. You are who God says that you are. So whenever that lie comes up, you're not good enough, you're inadequate, what you do is you replace that lie with the truth. When you begin a relationship with Christ, your old nature dies. It's gone. You have a new heart, a new spirit. You're a new creation, the Bible says. But just because you're spiritually new, it doesn't mean that those old memories just automatically go away. They don't. You'll see a video in a few minutes of a, a sweet lady who has an art exhibit out out here and you'll hear her story here for a minute and she had a first grade teacher um, it's a spoiler for first grade teacher that called her a dummy every day of her life after first grade was over she went back through first grade again with a teacher that believed in her changed her life but she can tell you specifically everything about that first first grade teacher. Those memories don't go away. We're often still haunted by those negative tapes 
I think of them as tape recordings that continue to play in the back of our mind. You know, I loved my father dearly, and he loved me dearly. We were different as night and day, but we loved each other dearly. But affirmation was not so much a part of his vocabulary. It just wasn't. Maybe it was a generational thing, maybe it was a family thing, but my dad just didn't do it. And, and, uh, and so I went through life without a lot of affirmation from him, without much at all. Now, this is where it gets interesting. My father was one of the charter members of Hope Church, the church for the unchurched. And for many, many years, he was here every single week. From the gymnasium, from the restaurant to the gym to our first building, second, third, until he got old and ill and ultimately passed away. When my dad would come for all those years, we have a comment card, you have it there, it asks for prayer requests and praises. But what I wished we just said out loud is give us your comments. We need to know what you think. And in those days, that's exactly what I did. Give us your comments. We need to know what you think. And people would write, and sometimes they would say, well, you're a lousy preacher, and sometimes they'd say, we love you. And, you know, it's a combination of, of things people would say. And every now and then, maybe once a year, maybe once every couple of years, I'd get one from my dad. And my dad's nickname was Ace. And it, the card, every time he wrote it, said the same thing. It said, good job, Ace. Over 20 years, I probably had maybe four, five of those cards. And every time I got one, I taped it above my desk in my office on the wall. And it stayed there for years. That's how much I needed that affirmation. Now, you know, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to live with the regret that my dad didn't affirm me enough. He did the best he could do. But that tape plays in my head to this day. It's what drives me. It, 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 it's what gives me my, my sense of mission about Hope Church and what we've done over the years. But those old tapes, they, they play in the background still. But you can drown them out with God's Word. So starting today, let's take up living a life based on different truths, okay? Let me give you these truths. God, first truth, God says He chose us. I love the fact that Jesus picked out Zacchaeus and went to his house. Others in the crowd were shocked, but for me, that brings me hope. If Jesus wanted to go to Zacchaeus' house, then he wants to come to my house. He wants to come to your house. He didn't stay with the religious rulers or the priests or the kings. He picked the guy who had to climb a tree because he was so desperate to find some little glimmer of hope for his life. And God is calling you, that little voice that says you're not good enough, it's wrong. God does not make junk. You are worthy of his love. He cares for you. I don't want you to raise your hand, but I want you to, I want you to think of the answer to this question in your head. <clears throat> How many of you are sick of the life you've been living? Trying to measure up to the expectations of other people, trying to be good enough. Jesus said, come to me, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and burdened and worn out. He says, come to me and I'll give you rest. Those of you that are searching and searching, thinking there's got to be more to life, I'm thirsty for something more. Jesus says, I am the living water. <coughs> Taste what I offer and you'll never thirst again. You hungry for something different in your life? Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Maybe you're lost and wandering through, wandering through life and you can't find your way. Jesus says, I'm the way. I'm the way. 
Are you believing the lies about yourself? Jesus says, I am the truth. You feel like you're dead on the inside? Jesus says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He is the one who is calling you, saying, I love you, I value you, I treasure you, follow me. See, God picked you. He picked me. He picked me before I was cleaned up. He picked me before I was going to church anywhere. He picked me at my worst possible moment. That's when he picked me, and that's when he picks you. Think of your worst possible moment from your past, the thing you're most ashamed about, and you won't share with anybody. That's when he picked you. He didn't pick you when you were all cleaned up and ready to go. Sometimes I talk to people about Jesus Christ, and they say, you know, I'd love to have a relationship with him, but i gotta, I got to clear some stuff up first. It's going to be a while. You do not. You do not. He chose you before you were cleaned up. And then God says he gifted us. I have special gifts, talents, and abilities that God gave me. You do too. I may not see them when I am believing lies, but they're there. God gave you unique talents and skills and gifts that he didn't give anybody else. Don't waste them. Don't hoard them. He gave you everything you need to be the person he created you to be. And the Bible's very clear about that. You know, for many years, I used to do church growth conferences around the world. And there would always be a host church. And uh, the conferences were well attended. And generally speaking, people liked what I was saying. And the pastor almost always would say, you need to stay over and preach this Sunday. Will you stay over and preach for me? And, and I, every time, I'd say no. And it hurt their feelings to say, why not? I said, it's not about you, it's about me. Well, why not? Our people would love to hear you. And I said, no, they would. No, I, I understand my skills, gifts, and abilities. And for reasons that only God knows, I have this gift of talking to you. And you respond to that. We, we have a dialogue, you and me. We've had it for 30 years. Or at least 20, the first 10, I'm not sure. I was trying to figure out who you were. <laughs> but you get me. And, and God does his work through me, whether it makes me nervous or not. But I, don't, I, I go to other churches, I don't have that gift. The timing's off, the jokes don't work. <laughs> People don't listen. You know, I can't do it. So I say no every time. Somebody asked me just this week if I'd preach. Hurt their feelings. It was a smaller church. Guy says, you, will you come out and preach for us? And I said, nope. I said, I'll come out and talk about church growth if you want. But I won't, I won't preach. Because I, I'm not gifted to do that in his church. I know that because I've tried it. So know what your gifts, talents, and abilities are. And then don't waste them. You know, I know people who actually have the gift of making money. A gift how many people would like to have? No one? Come on. <laughs> Lying right here in church. <laughs> Everybody would love to have the gift of making money. Some people actually do. I mean, they, it amazes me how they can make money. I wished I had that gift so bad, Hugh. It would mean everything to me to have that gift. I just don't have it. I've got a different gift. I've got the gift of spending money. <laughs> and I'm good at it. But if you've got the gift of making money and you're hoarding it or wasting it, using it all on yourself, you're missing the whole point. Where do you think that gift came from? God gave you that gift. So use it. Use it for him. Don't waste it. He gave you everything you need to be the person he created you to be. And the Bible's very clear on that point. It says, for we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. So one of the greatest goals of your spiritual journey is to talk you out of all that God has for you. You're not good enough. Your best is not going to get it done. Why bother trying? Give it up. Throw in the towel. You don't have what it takes. You're mediocre. You're average. You're simply not good enough. 
And that is simply not true. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, the Apostle Paul says. Whatever God calls you to do, he will equip you to do. You're not that good on your own, but with God, you can do everything he calls you to do. Today, I want you to meet someone in our church family who has found their gifting from God. Watch this. I think when I graduated from college and I had this dream job and opportunity to work in television back then, I missed that opportunity. I, I felt like I let myself down. I felt like I left my family down because I was the first in my immediate family to graduate from college. I went from this high to this nothing. I went from having all these opportunities to nothing almost overnight. And, and I, wouldn't, I wouldn't trade that now for, for anything because I think my life would have went a whole different uh, direction. I think I would have missed my calling. People tend to quantitate success with being able to achieve something like getting a degree or getting a, maybe a big house or something materialistic. There's nothing wrong with that. But what happens when you lose those, those things? If someone asks me you know, to answer the question, who am I and what do I do and why am I here? I am a vessel of hope, making the world better. And if I could do it through art, do it through speaking, do it through counseling, one-on-one, it, all of it for me ties it. And that for me gives glory to God. I failed the first grade because I had a teacher that called me dummy. She called me dummy Caldwell every, almost every day, and it really broke my spirit. And so restarting school with Mrs. Pentecost was a game changer for me. She spoke over me, and she told me how smart I was, uh, put me in an art contest, won a whole citywide art contest. And then nearly 40 years went by. I had never touched art, and uh, my family member I'm close to, uh, we had a conversation, and she just called it out of me. She says, the Lord says that you are an artist. I started laughing and, you know, I just really didn't receive that. And honestly, I lifted my hands up and I said, well, Lord, if you are calling art out of me, let it inspire. Let it be an extension of what you've already put me in the earth to do. And so with the paper towel art, I'm able to extend both. So I, I say that my paper towel art is an extension of my, my healing art. And um, I never thought that I could use paper towel and intertwine that in, in what I do. Can you believe that? You know, <clears throat> Brenda is here today, and one of her paintings is outside on the floor. You should go by and look at it. And what a sweet-spirited lady who gets it. A visual display of our life change when we let go of the lies and believe God's truth. He has gifted us. God says with him we are complete. I have kept reading that last line in the passage we read earlier. We often skip over it, but look again at verse 9. Zacchaeus is standing there having poured out to Jesus all his faults and mistakes and is offering to repay fourfold, and Jesus gets to the real point. He says, today is salvation day in this home. Here he is, Zacchaeus, son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to find and restore the lost. You and me. The Living Bible puts it this way. This shows that salvation has come to this home today. This man was one of the lost sons of Abraham. And I, the Messiah, have come to search for and to save such souls as his. You and me. You realize you have everything that you need thanks to Christ? 2 Peter 1.3 says, We have everything we need to live a life that pleases God. Everything. It was all given to us by God's own power when we learn that he had this wonderful goodness. You're complete in Christ. Here's the truth. People don't complete you. Jerry Maguire was wrong. People don't complete you. Christ completes you. A spouse doesn't complete you. Jesus Christ does. Things don't complete you. Well, I got to have this to be happy. I got to have more to be fulfilled. I got to have more money. I got to have a nicer house or nicer car. I got to have everything paid off before I can be happy. No. Money, things, people. 
They don't complete you. Christ does. So what are you missing? Find it in Christ. You need peace in your life. In Christ, you find a peace that the world doesn't even know anything about. You need strength. His strength is made perfect in your weakness. You need comfort. A comfort like a mother comforts her child. That's what God does. Here's the challenge. Take some time this week and reflect on the areas of your life that you make comparisons. Do you compare yourself to others in such a way that you tear them down or you tear yourself down? Do the words of your mouth build up or tear down? Do the words of your soul build up or tear down? If we're looking, there is someone in your life that you can breathe some truth into. The power of a teacher's words changed the future of Brenda's life forever. Now, you don't have to be a teacher by trade to be a teacher of God's truth in a friend's life. A teacher did that for me late in life, but friends can do that over and over as well. Now, they talk during announcements about the invitation in your bulletin. I suspect we all know a few Zacchaeuses who could use a little hope. You may not, they may not look like it, but in this Facebook generation, I promise you what's behind their closed door is very different from what you think it is. You know some Zacchaeus. Has ever wondered if he knew Jesus was coming due to the buzz on the street, Zacchaeus? Or did someone tell him something about this Jesus that made him curious? Don't miss the opportunity. I encourage you to invite God to remind you of who you are and whose you are. Let your mind be renewed with God's truth. Those of you that still deal with the negative tapes from the past, it's time to let them go. Turn them way down so you can't hear anything else. You're not who others say you are. You are not the sum total of your past. You're not inadequate. You do have what it takes. You can measure up. You do have what it takes. Comparing yourself to others just doesn't work. If you perceive yourself as better than them, then you're filled with pride. If you pe perceive your, them as better than you, then you get jealous and feel defeated. Replace the lies with God's truth, the truth we find in his word. And the Bible tells us that his word, his truth, will renew our minds. It will help us live by his truth from his word, and you can create new tapes to play in your mind, which allows you to turn the old tapes down. Now, I don't want to oversimplify this because some of you have been living for years believing these, the, these lies. And it's going to take some time to make this change, to change the channel in your thinking. And it's one of the reasons I encourage you to get involved during the week with our Lenten challenge of Bible reading or to join us daily at noon for the Facebook Live sessions. I think I'm on Tuesday, but one of our pastors is up each day why would we do that? To offer you tools each day to give up the things that keep you from being all you can be and tools that allow you to see the truth. God picked you. He loves you. You are complete. Everything that you need is available through him. Just take it. Let's pray together. Father, in my career, I can't think of another dilemma people live with more than comparisons. And we compare everything. We compare cars, we compare jobs, we compare money, we compare families. And, and it completely abuses us of the opportunity to focus on you. How have you gifted me? What gifts, skills, talents, and abilities have you given just me? Nobody can do it just like me. And that's true of every person in this room. Help us discover how to be fully engaged in the gifts that you have given us so that we can be complete. For we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to receive God's blessing? 
Now may grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit rest and abide with you all, both now and in the life everlasting. Amen.